Okay, turn to me to uh, 1 Chronicles 12, 32. 1 Chronicles 12, 32. Let me just uh, open with a prayer. Jesus, we love you again. Thank you for your zeal for our fullness and your desire, whether it's from the pastoral heart or that prophetic spirit you want to make known even to us time and season, but even more importantly, how do we prepare and carry our heart so that we more than just overcome, but actually we will shine for you, even in the generations that you are returning. I'm asking that even as you direct our heart to the very book of Daniel in this season, Lord, we want more than just knowing a book. We want more than just having more information. We want to hear your heart. We want to understand you as the author and the perfecter of human history and you are the first and the last Alpha and Omega will you grant us insight with clarity the biblical narrative of what is going to happen at the very end of the age more than just insight we want understanding we want clarity we want wisdom so that firstly we are found ready in understanding and more than that we may arise as what you say in Daniel 11. Those who understand shall instruct many. The voices, messenger, that you are preparing even to make many other ready so that we can shine as we turn and walk in the path of righteousness and holiness. Thank you that you have given us such a precious book as the divine road map and that holy uh, uh, instruction that give us such clarity as the instruction manual so that we can be prepared that we may arise like Daniel even as he burn and shine for you in the darkest hour of the very nation of Israel we may likewise by the power of your Holy Spirit and that direction even through your written word that we may become that Daniel 1132 and 33 people. I commit this time even unto you, even as we embark on this journey in pressing in unto your heart through the very book of Daniel. Cause us to be like the very sons of Isaac, that we may understand the time and know what to do. And more than that, we will arise as a Daniel 1132, 33 people, that we shall know you and we shall be strong in our inner man. And we shall partner with you to do great exploit. And as men and women of understanding, that we shall instruct many. Our hearts are filled with confidence and hope because you have already prepared the way. And you are such a great leader. And you will direct us and prepare us. So we place our confidence in you. And we are asking by your Holy Spirit, will you equip us, prepare us, so that we will be the very people that you are looking for in this time. We commit this time unto you. We ask for you to speak to us. May you increase and we decrease. Holy Spirit, we so need you. We so love you. Thank you that you desire to teach us. So come as a spirit of truth. Brief revelation and understanding upon this 12 chapter book so that we may more than just understand and grasp, but we encounter that truth that will empower our heart so that we are being transformed. Let truth in the book of Daniel establish in us. We love you, we bless you. Again, we want Jesus to increase and we decrease. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, turn to me to. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 12. We are embarking on a new series. Uh, probably would take about 12 to 15 weeks 
probably maybe even longer. Twelve weeks is about three months, right? By then, Faith will be a mother already. Uh, yeah, twelve to fifteen weeks. Okay. Uh, huh? Not yet lah. Soon lah. Soon about there lah. Okay, I will do an, I I will do twelve to twenty weeks lah. Uh, so that so that we will give birth, you know, as a very people of God. But but the key is that we are embarking on this journey, you know, through the teaching of the very book of Daniel. You know, most of us are familiar with the very book of Daniel. It's one of a prophetic book in the Old Testament. Okay, in the Old Testament. Of course, they are divided into major prophet and minor prophet. Major prophet, minor prophet, not they are not in terms of their importance or in terms of the length of the book. Okay, yeah. So uh, Daniel is one of the major prophetic book in the Old Testament. But I mean, my personal opinion. Okay, but shouldn't be that far off. Okay, not because I'm important, but it's true. It's a very important biblical. B- I mean, of course, they are, all sixty-six books are important. But there are time and season Holy Spirit emphasize because our God is living and alive, you know. Uh, all 66 books are timeless, you know, but there are time and season He will emphasize on a specific passage or a specific book, you know, like uh, uh, John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16. You know, I probably will end this year by talking about John 17, okay, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, depending on how many weeks we're going to take the book of Daniel, okay? But 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 this book is a very important book in this time, in this season, in this hour of human history. Because truly, many will agree. Again, we don't know exactly when, but that we believe that this is the genera- We are in the generation where Jesus is returning. We really are raising towards the end of the age. If we understand what Bible say about trend, events, personalities that Bible talks about concerning the end of the age. We are seeing much of it happening and being revealed right before our eyes. That's why the book of Daniel is very critical. You know why? Because we need knowledge, we need clarity, we need understanding of the biblical narrative pertaining to the end of the age. Having knowledge and clarity is no longer a luxury. It's no longer a good to have. We have to know. It's a necessity because it will come like an anchor that stabilizes us. Because if we are in the, I, I haven't really gone on cruise for a long time, you know. Uh, but, but if you are a ship that is tra- uh, not traveling, you ship, you cruise in the sea with storm. What you really want is stability. That's why having knowledge and clarity about what is to come and God's word and what is his heart and his plan is so important. That's what makes the book of Daniel so critical because it's like the anchor that will stabilize us and more than that, like a compass and a road map that direct our path. But the most important that this book is like, you know, we talk about the book of Joel. This is another very important book, like an instruction manual that will equip and prepare us so that we shine, so that we prevail, so that we overcome. Okay, take me to 1 Chronicles 12, verse uh, 32. I'm still feeling a bit breathless, uh, contagious by... Uh, uh, faith, okay, we all, all have pregnant sickness, <laughs> yeah, okay, no, just kidding, okay, tell me the 1 Chronicle 12 verse 32, very familiar verse, it's so pivotal, but we are at this time, at this hour, that we have to go beyond just cliche, having to quote it, no, uh, have ability to quote it, we truly must be like the sons of Isaac, who understand the time and to know exactly what to do. It's no longer a luxury. We need it. More than just because we are a voice, okay? To be a voice, firstly, you yourself and I myself need to be ready because we can't prepare others unless we ourselves are prepared, okay? 1 Corinthians 12, 32 say this, of the sons of Isaac who understand the time and to know what to do. We need understanding, and we need to know what to do. Okay. There are many books in the Bible that fits that bill. 
but the book of Daniel is one of them. One of the very important apocalyptic book, okay, that give us one together the book of Revelation. Book of Re- is, Daniel is like a book of book of Revelation in the Old Testament. Uh, Revelation is like the book of Daniel in the New Testament. Okay, it's a very important book that fits a bill of one Chronicle twelve thirty two. No, I say fits a bill because if we get what Daniel is trying to say. We will understand the time. And if we respond to the instruction of the book of Daniel, we will know what to do, specifically about how do we prepare ourselves. Because Daniel gives us one of the, if not the most, one of the most detailed and clearest information about end time. Okay. It's a book that is, no, I, I don't want to say it's a book that is full of, but filled with prophetic dreams and visions. There are five that give us such accuracy and clarity and prophecy of end of the age. Yeah, it's the, the precision and the accuracy is astounding. That caused many scholars to kind of like do not believe that Daniel wrote the book. Because Daniel wrote many events prior to three, four hundred years before happening within his lifetime. With such precision and accuracy, okay, from from the 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 Babylonian Empire all way go until the end of the age where God told him detailed informations about the rising up of the Antichrist Empire that would dominate and persecute the nation of Israel. That's why this is such an important book because it gives us such detail. More than just information, uh, quite prophetic information that if we understand, we have such clarity of the biblical narrative. Whether it's a personality, the trend, what is to come, okay? But more than that, this is more than just an end time book. It it is an end time book, but it's more than just giving an end time uh, details and so on and so on. It gives us the pattern, the prototype, and the prophetic picture of how a end time generation can live victoriously in the darkest hour of human history through the life of Daniel. Okay, I will talk about it next few weeks. Okay, Daniel lived in one of the most challenging environments, but he is the only, of course, don't talk about Jesus, okay? Jesus has no sin, so on, but he is the only man in the Bible, even David has. Moses had plenty, okay? Uh, I want to say Kechong, but I'm not in the Bible, okay? Uh, 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 he's the only man in the Bible that has no record of sin. And it's not exactly, it's kind of like doing homeschool and so on and so on. He's in one of the worst environment and he prevailed. God raised him up as a pattern. How he cultivate, how he live out that lifestyle is the model, the prototype, and the pattern of the end time generation. God primarily wants us to emulate his lifestyle. That's why when you read the book of Daniel, it's more than just an apoc- apocalyptic book. But it is the manual in preparing the very end time generations that we will burn, we will shine. Okay, take me to Daniel chapter 11. <coughs> Daniel chapter 11. We talk a lot about Daniel 11, verse 32 and verse 33 people. The life of Daniel personified that. This is kind of like, you know, Daniel, like, kind of he, he wrote the book and said, oh, that's me, Daniel 11, 32, 33. Okay, that's why when we study it, Studying the life of Daniel is critical. Because a lot of time, we just want to focus on end time events. But God record his life in detail with an intention for us to see, to learn, and also the divine training manual. Daniel 11, verse 32 and verse 33. Okay. Give us insight to what it means to be a Daniel 11, 32, 33 people through the life of Daniel. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Daniel did some exploit. 
I mean, come on, you know. Uh, uh, in the lion's den and uh, 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 the lion didn't eat him up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And of course, his friend too, throwing into the fiery furnace, you know, uh, they become hotter in their heart, you know, and also influence Nebuchadnezzar. You know, it's, this is an all powerful pattern. Okay. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploit. And those of the people who understand shall instruct many. Daniel. Referring to Daniel and his three friends. Next week, I'll talk about his, his, their name. Okay, you know, we worry about changing name. Man, they were given all the demonic names, man. Their names are all the pagan gods. Okay, Abunigo, you know, it's kind of sun god. and uh, No, not Abunigo, Abunigo. Yeah, next week, next week. That's for next week. One more verse. Daniel... 12, verse 3. Daniel 12, verse, talking about there will be a group of people that will shine. More than just shine. They will turn many to righteousness. This is more than just saving our own skin. Yeah, yeah. You know, thank God lion didn't eat me. You know. But they more than just influence people. They influence kings. Not just good kings evil kings and they influence nations and empire. That's why it's such a powerful book because God is raising up the end time generation like Daniel and the three friends to influence people and to influence evil kings. That is a key thing. Daniel 12 verse 3 Those who are wise shall shine like a bright brightness of the firmament. Okay, this is not just some pavement in Orchard Road. The firmament that is before the very throne of God, that is like a crystal sea, that shine. You know? That will be the destiny of the end time generation. We will shine so brightly. Okay, but more than shine. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. That's why this is one of the most known book. More than just for people who are curious or interested in eschatology, but actually for the end time generation because it will prepare us. And more than that, also for the very voice of God that we may have clarity, that we may have understanding, that we are able to interpret correctly and accurately and we will know how to respond even in this time. Okay, today I'm going to primarily give you a lot of information about the book. No, important information because my, my goal and my heart is that so that we don't just come and listen to the teaching. When we read, we understand. And we understand the background and so on and so on. So primarily, I'm going to give you an introduction, overview, general outline, and also why. There are five reasons why we study the book of Daniel. And also four very important time frame in the book of Daniel is very important so that we understand end of the age. Yeah, this is the book that gives us the clearest timeline. That's a key thing. Okay, so first one. Introduction to the book of Daniel. Introduction to the book of Daniel. Uh, like I say, one of the major prophets when I say major prophet, it's not like he's a prophetic guy. Yeah, okay. Actually, most Jewish scholars don't consider Daniel as a prophetic guy. They consider him as a governmental guy. But man, I say, who cares about the title? This guy has four main dreams and vision that I wouldn't say change the history of the nations, but tell us of the future of nations. Okay, So who cares? That's why... I'm no concern about title, no. If I have revelation, you can call me anything. Apostle, apostole, uh, prophet, or just a doorkeeper, no. Yeah, but, 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 you know, why am I talking about this? Okay, uh, one of the major prophetic book in the Old Testament, okay. But uh, again, many Jewish scholars don't actually consider either the book, of, don't consider the book of Daniel as a prophetic book. They primarily treat it as a historical book, but actually it's a half-half kind of thing. Okay, later we come to it. Okay, also, they don't really consider Daniel as a prophetic guy, unlike Jeremiah, uh, uh, Ezekiel. Okay, Any, anyway, Daniel is very unique. It's the only book 
that is written, no, I mean only prophetic book that is written in the exile period. Okay. Most are either pre-exile or post-exile. Of course, historical books there are, okay, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, and also the book of Esther. Okay. So primarily, one of the major prophet prophetic book in the Old Testament. Okay. There are a few uniqueness of the book of Daniel. Okay. It's very unique. Okay. This book is primarily written between uh, it's about written between 536 BC to 530 BC, okay, at the grand old age of Daniel, you know, 85 years old. It's kind of like wow, you know. I wonder how I wonder whether they have Lao Hua in <laughs> ancient probably may, may, may not. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, Daniel, okay, a few uniqueness about the book of Daniel. Firstly is this. Yeah, it's a 12-chapter book, primarily written by Daniel. Okay, why do I say primarily written by Daniel? Because King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonian Empire contributed a chapter. Chapter 4, okay. Yeah, only... W- the only chapter in the Bible that is written by a non-Jew, non-believer, and a pagan person. Wow. You know, they say God can use anybody. Okay. So this is the this book is primarily written by Daniel. He wrote 11 chapters. Okay. But Nebuchadnezzar contributed one chapter, okay, chapter four. Of course, uh, we can argue that Nebuchadnezzar probably got saved, you know, if you read chapter four. You know, I do agree, okay, but some people think that Nebuchadnezzar will even be shocked, okay. So it's a very unique book, okay, firstly, uh, primarily written by Daniel, uh, with Nebuchadnezzar as an author of uh, Daniel chapter four. Okay, the book is probably written between 536 to 530 BC. No one, no one actually know. Okay, Daniel probably is about 85 years old or older. Okay, second, second is another uniqueness of this book, because the book of Daniel, we all know. Okay, Old Testament is primarily written in what language? Chew. No. <laughs> uh, Hebrew. Okay, it's our joke. Uh, Old Testament is primarily written in Hebrew. New Testament, Greek. Written in Greek. But Book of Daniel is very unique. Book of Daniel is not entirely written in Hebrew. But the Book of Daniel is written in two different languages. Okay. Chapter 1, all the way to chapter 2, verse 3, is written in Hebrew. Then from chapter 4, no, chapter 2, verse 4, all the way until end of chapter 7 is written in Aramaic. And then from chapter 8, all the way until chapter end of the chap- no, uh, end of the book is written in Hebrew. Okay. So it's a very unique book. It's in two written in two languages. Okay. Yeah. Uh, why? Okay, I can think of two reasons. Firstly, is that God of Israel want to speak to the Gentile nations. You see, you must know that the heart of the God of Israel is also for nations. Okay, there, are, there are many things in the book of Daniel is speaking to the Gentile nations because it's pertaining to the future of the Gentile nation. Even though Israel is, a, is at the center of the entire book, Israel formed the context of many of, no, of all the prophecy in the book of Daniel. Okay. But God's heart is to speak to the Gentile nation. Okay. The second reason is that you must know that when this book was written, where were the Jewish people primarily? Of course, some left behind in uh, Jerusalem. But a lot of them are being exiled in Babylon. So many of them actually don't speak Hebrew anymore. They speak Aramaic. So God wants to communicate with His people. God always wants to speak to His people. That's why it's written in uh, uh, Aramaic. Okay, That's a key thing. <laughs> so that's the uniqueness of this book. Give you 
the overview of the book of Daniel, okay, there are at least uh, four things. Overview of the book of Daniel. Then I'm going to give you the outline. The first one, the first one. To me, not just to me, to most people, two of the most important biblical book pertaining to end time. Two. One is in Old Testament, of course, it's the book of Daniel. Another one is in New Testament, is uh, the book of Revelation. Okay, Anyone who wants to have understanding of end of the age, you must know the book of Daniel and you must know the book of Revelation. I say earlier, the book of Daniel is like the Old Testament version of the book of Revelation. Uh, and the book of Revelation is like a New Testament of the book of Daniel, okay, both give very significant, very important detail and also information and also personality about the end of the age. And there are a lot of similarity, but the focus and also the addresses and the, and the prophecy focus primarily differently. Okay, for the book of Daniel, primarily written from the perspective of the nation of Israel. Israel is at the heart. Israel is at the center. Okay? Much of the prophetic dream or vision is addressing, of course, ultimately, it's about future kingdom of God that God is going to establish here on earth. Okay? But primarily focus on the future of the nation of Israel. You must understand that give them a lot of hope and encouragement. Because God always say that they will be the nation that will lead nations. But they were under Gentile domination that began with 586 BC. So this book gives them a lot of hope and encouragement. But later they will realize that there will be another 2,500 over years before this happened. You know, man, look at it. Wow, you know, it's going to happen. So when, when now this is my own thinking. Okay, when Zechariah, not Zechariah, ah, Zechariah, when uh, Zerubbabel, Joshua, all this went back, he said, now is it the time? Is it the time? Probably all the prophets said, no, no. That's a key thing. So Daniel specifically come from the perspective of the nation of Israel. But the book of Revelation primarily is written from the perspective of the Gentile church. Even though there are many similarities, both addresses Gentile nations, okay? Of course, in the book of Daniel, there's no concept of the Gentile church. But the book of Revelation devotes only one chapter to the nation of Israel. That's Revelation chapter 12, okay? Okay, second, second. The book of Revel no, the book of Daniel is is the only uh, prophetic book in the Old Testament written in the exile period of the nation of Israel. One of the tragic history of the nation of Israel, but it's the only prophetic book that's written in the exile period. Okay, of course, there are three other written in the exile period, but they are historical book. Okay, uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, and also Esther. Okay, the entire book cover the time span. Okay, this is very interesting. It's proven in the history. Cover was written within the time span of 606 BC to 536 BC. Okay. When, when you open Daniel chapter 1, it's 606 BC. Israel faced the first siege. Daniel got exported. When chapter 6 closes, it's 536 BC. So the entire book covered the time span of 606 BC and 536 BC. And through it, okay, you see the reign of five pagan kings and two world empires, Babylon and Persia. Babylon and Persia, okay? It began with the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, okay? That was succeeded by uh, uh, the king, the, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, Eva Merodach. Then after that, by Belsexer, okay? And then, 
uh, uh, Persian, no, then Persian Empire overthrown the Babylonian Empire came uh, Darius, who is actually more of Medes king. And then lastly, King Cyrus. Okay, so the book of Daniel didn't mention about evil Merodach. Okay, but Daniel probably served all five. Served all five kings. Very unique. Because when empire change, you know, they will kill everybody. Okay, Daniel must be such a brilliant... No, I'm not talking political or he know how to do this uh, uh, diplomatic maneuver because he's such a unique, excellent person. Subsequent kings and subsequent empire actually kept him. Okay, most, most important person of the uh, previous king, when the subsequent king take over, they'll remove all the people. Okay, there's a reason why in Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar refused to reveal his dream. You know why? Because most of the people were the people of his father. So he couldn't trust them. Okay. The fact that Daniel succeed, no, Daniel served under five different kings and two different empires speaks a lot about that man. Not because he knows how to do political maneuver. Because he's such a brilliant, excellent man that we can learn a lot, okay? So, the book of Daniel primarily stretches between the time span of 606 BC to 536 BC that run through the reign of five kings. Two empires, five kings, okay? Nebuchadnezzar, Eva, Merodach, Belsexa, Darius, which is a Medes... Persian king, and then, of course, uh, King Cyrus, King Cyrus, okay. When the book begins, Daniel is probably about 15 or 16 years old. By the time we reach chapter 6, later I'll explain why, I only stop at chapter 6, okay, because the whole book is written in two structure, okay. By the time he reached uh, Daniel chapter 6, Daniel is no longer a young man. No? That's why when, no, I, I never really been to Sunday school because I, I wasn't a believer when I was young. You know? I always hear Sunday school story, Daniel and the lion's den is like his young boy, very cute or young man. No, no, by the time he was in the lion's den, he's at least 50, 85 years old. Maybe that's the reason why Daniel, uh, the lion didn't want to eat him. No? Oh, no, no meat. No, just kidding. <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, the whole book also records 70 year life history of Daniel. That's a key thing. Okay. Yeah, but unlike any other pre exile book, okay, like, uh, I'm not talking about a, a prophetic book, like Jeremiah, like Ezekiel, the book of Daniel do not mention anything about the Jewish people before they are being conquered or exiled. Their sin and so on. Okay? Because the purpose is not to highlight their failing or shortcoming or their sin or their rebellion. The purpose is to teach us that in the most challenging time, how do we carry our heart? And also in the midst of God's discipline, how do we respond to God correctly? And also in the midst of that very challenging environment, you know, where you face many darkness and, and, and situations that you can compromise, that you stand firm, unwaver, and refuse to compromise. That's what the book of Daniel is all about, okay? So that's the second thing. The third thing, third thing. <coughs> the name Daniel actually means God is my judge. God is my judge. What a apt name for this book. Because this book is about the judgment of God. Because Israel, why Israel was being exiled? Because she is being judged for her rebellion. That is a key thing. Okay. And of course, it's also very apt because it also talks about God's judgment for nations, for kingdom. Okay, because the entire book of Daniel, uh, whether it's through the dreams or the visions, you know, we see a few kingdoms, but more importantly, the 
the empire that will rise up at the end of the age, okay, which is called Antichrist and this empire, God will judge all. Ending with the establishment of the very kingdom of God. You know, that's why in Daniel 2, you know, Nebuchadnezzar have a dream, you know, where you see sub all the major world empire ending with the Antichrist empire at the end of the age. Then came is uh, uh, came a stone uh, uh, that is unheaved that will smash the end, all the kingdoms and then the great mountain arise which is talking about the whole judgment of God on nations. But primarily, it's a very apt title because God is judging Israel because of a rebellion. And also, God is going to judge kingdoms and nations with the ultimate goal of establishing the very kingdom of God. Okay? And of course, He will restore the nation of Israel. Okay? But I'm going to sidetrack a little bit. Okay? I have no time to really run through it, but I'm going to put this chart uh, in, uh, it's called video, right? Yeah, so that you can go and read on your own because there are two judgments that God judge Israel, even through the exile in Babylon, okay? That's why when you study the history of Israel when she's, she's being exiled, there is interestingly 270 years period. One begins with 606 BC and end in 536 BC. Another one begins in 586 BC and end in 516 BC. Okay. Center around two sieges of Babylon unto Jerusalem. That's why tr uh, many people ask is it the 606 to 536 BC judgment that is 70 years or 586 BC to uh, 516 BC, which is the third? Siege as a 70 year judgment is both. It's both. Okay, no time to run through it. Just write it down. Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 1 to 6. Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 1 to 6 talks about two different judgments. Okay, that divided into the two 70 years, you know, in the whole exile history of the nation of Israel. The first judgment primarily is called the servitude of the nation of Israel. That's from 606 BC to 536 BC. Okay. Write this down. Primarily is from 2 Chronicle 36, verse 21. They were being judged because as a nation they did not observe Sabbath. Not the weekly Sabbath, but the seven year cycle Sabbath. Okay. Uh, Jewish people call it Shemitah. Okay. Because they neglected, it's 490 years. Okay. That means God is kind of telling them, you owe me 70 Sabbath. That's why He brings forth that judgment. Okay. Then of course, there is a second judgment. It's called the dissolution of Jerusalem, which is from 586 B.C., to 516 BC, primarily is for her rebellion. Okay, it's for her rebellion. Just write this down. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11 and 12. Jeremiah 20, uh, Jeremiah 25, verse 11 and 12. Okay, so that is the third thing about the book of Daniel. Okay, Daniel means God is my judge. It's because it described the judgment of God. Firstly, of course, for the nation of Israel. And then, the judgment of God for kingdoms, okay? Future kingdoms from Babylon to Persia to Greece to uh, Roman and so on and so on. Eventually, the ultimate judgment of the most evil empire ever exists in human history led by Antichrist and his ten-nation ten confederation Crescendo with the establishment of the kingdom of God with Yeshua, not the stone, uh, as the son of man in Daniel 7, that he will sit on the throne forever and ever. Okay, fourth one. <coughs> fourth one. I'm going to give you the historical background and the historical setting of the book of Daniel. So that when you read, you understand. You know the timeline and so on, but primarily, what actually happened? Okay, So the historical background, 
and the historical setting of Daniel, primarily centered around three sieges of the Babylonian Empire upon Jerusalem. If you know that uh, the, the, the siege of Babylon Empire upon the nation of Israel, which is sent by God, there are three different sieges. 606 BC, uh, 597 BC, of course, historically, they have a little discrepancy. Something is 605, okay, but something is 606. So we just take the 606. Three siege, 606 BC, 597 BC, and then 586 BC, okay, where the first siege, that's where Daniel, together with many young men, they were being exported to uh, uh, Babylon, okay? And also many people didn't realize that Daniel is actually from a royal bloodline. He's not just kind of like a boy in the village uh, playing in the playground, unfortunately got caught and being bring to uh, the court of a king. No, they, they were bring the best of the best Jewish people, okay? So Daniel is like the cream of the crop, okay? So that's the historical setting of Daniel. The book actually began... In 606 BC, with the first siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonian. Okay. And in the book, okay, they are that overlap with the last, I'm gonna say it right, the last four kings of the nation of Israel. Okay, the last four kings. It's very important to see know these last four kings. So that when you read, you read together with whether it's one chronicle, two chronicle, one king, two kings, you can see, okay? These are the last four kings, okay? By, the, by then, you know, they are primarily the vassal king of Babylon. Why you frown, okay? Huh? Judah, yeah, but it's, it can call house of Israel too, okay? The last four kings, okay? The first one is Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. All the Kim one, all the Jeho Jehoiakim. 609 BC to 597 BC. Okay, that's where he faced the first siege. Okay, they're not very smart. Okay, later I'll tell you. You know why? Because they were the vessel of uh, Babylon. Okay, vessel means they will still give them autonomy, but they're under the subject of Babylon. Okay, then Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel was deported in the second siege. Okay, Jeremiah, Ezekiel warned them, don't rebel. It's God's will. Okay, but there were a lot of false prophets, you know, come and boost the ego of the king. No, God's with you. You know, we shouldn't be under Gentile domination. So they revolt and rebel, you know. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar sent the second siege because he rebelled. Okay, so we can learn even lessons from this, you know. If it's God's will, submit. That's where you're going to read Jeremiah 29. You know, we often quote Jeremiah 29 verse 11 where Jeremiah said, God has a plan for you to prosper you and not to harm you. You know what's in the context? The context is Jeremiah is telling the Jewish people, it's God's will to send Nebuchadnezzar and bring many of you exiled in Babylon. Don't resist. Go. Imagine if uh, uh, a prophet come and tell Singaporean, uh, okay, politically incorrect, but that's going to say, that's, I'm going to say it as a joke, okay? Yeah, Malaysia is going to dominate Singapore. Singapore will exile into Ulu Ulu place, you know. Kamp Kampong in Kedah, you know. It's God's will. He has a perfect plan for you. Imagine you say in Shangri La and all this. I said, wow, you no. Know? I said, no, submit. He has a perfect plan for you to bless you. That is the context. When you read it, sometimes you can, wow, you know, your way is not my way, neither your thoughts, my thoughts. Okay, why? Uncle Yap so grum. Okay. So, so the first. The, the fourth last king, Jehoiakim, 609 to 597 BC. Then after that, the second last, which is very short, less than a year, Jehoahaz, Jehoahaz, J-E-H-O-A-H-A-Z. You can consider naming your sons on this name, okay, yeah. Yeah, I have a friend called Jehoiakim. 
Yeah, yeah. I know. Last time in primary school, he said, what kind of name is it? Then I realized, wow. Okay. Okay, then the second last king, Johoa Chin. Okay, now it's Chin, uh, not Kim. Uh. First one is Korean, now it's Chinese. No, I'm just joking. Okay. Uh, first one is Johoa Kim. Then after that, Johoa Hairs. Then the second last is Johoa Chin. Okay, okay. He also have another name called Jeconiah. Jeconiah, okay. 598 to 597 BC, also very short, one year. Last one, last one. Before that, absolute desolation of Jerusalem is uh, Zedekiah. Zedekiah, 597 to 586 BC. Okay, so the book began with the first siege, 606 BC by Babylon. That's where Daniel and many Jewish royal blood got exiled. Okay, of course the book right all the way until uh, entire demises of uh, Jerusalem and also the nation of Judah. Okay, give you a little bit more detail on all the three siege. Okay, now I'm going to give you the outline because it's very important for you to understand so that you can see. Okay, yeah. Okay, first siege. 506 BC. Okay, it's about five years better. Okay, Jehovah Kim, Kim. Uh, okay, Jehovah Kim then was a vassal king under Nebuchadnezzar because they formed a lie, or rather, they submit to Babylon. You must remember, remember jo Josiah died because he went to fight with the king of Egypt, Necho. There's a reason. Okay, I have no time to explain. Okay. But Jehoiakim revolt against Nebuchadnezzar because of the encouragement by the false prophet. Okay, that's where Nebuchadnezzar got fed up. No, that's my own word. Okay, and uh, uh, Cain. Okay, that begins the first seventy-year judgment of God for Israel, six hundred six BC. Okay, second siege. I you can look at the chart. Okay, I know I can't show you the chart now. I'm going to post it. In the YouTube can, right? Yeah. Ah, link in the whatever. Okay. Then second siege, 597 BC. 597. B okay, the first siege. Okay, you can read Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 17 to 19. Jeremiah 22, verse 17 to 19. Second siege, 597 BC. Jehoah Chin or Jeconiah. Okay, rain until the siege is over. Okay, Jeremiah 22, verse 24 to verse 13. Jeremiah 22, verse 24 to verse 13. He was captured. Okay, then this time around, poor Ezekiel also went with him. Okay, he's the one that eyes got poked out. Okay, then after that, was succeeded by his uncle, Zedekiah. Okay, second, he didn't learn. <laughs> Because when he became king, he was still a vassal king under Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. This time around, because Ezekiel exiled with it, Jeremiah warned him, hey, don't rebel and revoke against Babylonians because it's God's discipline for the nation of Israel. Okay. But he listened to all the false prophets. That's, that's what Jeremiah 23 is all about where he prophesied against all the false prophets, false teachers, and so on and so on. Obviously, he rebelled, okay. That's why he led to the third siege, 586 BC. 586 BC. Jeremiah, twi Jeremiah 32, verse 5. Jeremiah 39, verse 6 and 7. Ezekiel... <coughs> Chapter 12, verse 13, and 2 Kings 25, verse 1 to 7. Third siege, 586 BC. That's where Nebuchadnezzar came. Totally destroyed Jerusalem, plunder the entire city, destroy and desolate the temple. And totally, the entire city was ruined. That's where 70 years later, when Zerubbabel, all this came back. Remember, they cried because they looked at the city and said, wow, no, it's absolutely 
desolated. That's begin the second 70-year judgment called the Dissolution of Jerusalem, 586 BC to 516 BC, okay, where the judgment end when the Temple of Jerusalem was fully rebuilt. Okay. So that is the historical background and the historical setting of the book of Daniel. Very intriguing, isn't it? Yeah, when you put everything together, you learn a lot. You see God's working and so on and so on. Okay, fifth thing about the book of Daniel. Fifth thing about the book of Daniel. Primarily, it's about the life of Daniel. Okay. Uh, in Daniel chapter 1, he's probably about 15 or 16 years old, got deported. Okay. By the time he reached the end of uh, the book of Daniel, in Daniel 6, he's probably 85 years old or Order, okay. God intentionally put down and record with specificity for entire six chapter of the book of Daniel, and also seventy years of his life serving through five kings is because he want us to know about the life of Daniel, for us to learn. The life of Daniel is the model for end time saints so that we can overcome. There are nine character traits of Daniel that God wants us to emulate and also to cultivate. Okay, of course, I'll take the next uh, two, three, or four sessions to run through, primarily from Daniel 1 to Daniel 6. But I run through quickly so that when you read, you can understand. Because chapter 1 to 6 is like a divine blueprint in teaching us how to prepare ourselves. And how does a victorious saint, I mean, there are evidence, you know, man, throw into the lion's den. If you throw me into a house full of cats, uh, then uh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, nine character traits of Daniel. First one, Daniel 1 verse 8. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. <coughs> a man who is single-minded and wholehearted in following God. You must, you must understand, he was exiled from Jerusalem to a place that's full of idols. Okay. It's not as simple as how come he cannot eat the food of the king? There are reasons, okay. So that's the first character trait. A man who is single-minded and wholehearted in following his God, okay. Second, second, a man who has confidence in God. A man who has confidence in God. Daniel 1, verse 11 to 15. Third one, I will expound more on subsequent sessions. Third one, third one. A man who is dependent on the wisdom, counsel, and the prophetic direction of God. Daniel 2, verse 14 to 19. That's why I always say, the end time church has to be prophetic. It's not about we figuring out. We need divine revelation, understanding, wisdom. So that we know how to navigate and also prevail. Daniel is such a man, okay, filled with wisdom and counsel and the prophetic understanding of God. Daniel 2, verse 14 to 19. Fourth one, a man of humility. That's why God endued him with such gifts, you know, because when, when Nebuchadnezzar asked, can you interpret? Said, no man can interpret the dream. Okay, no man except my God. Okay, a man of humility, Daniel 2, verse 37, no, verse 27 to verse 30. Fifth one, a man who is used by God as his messenger, which is a powerful prototype of end time messenger. More than just speaking to the people of God, this guy is like speaking to Kim Jong un or Vladimir Putin, the evil of the evil man. Okay, it's not exactly speak to uh, uh, 
Billy Graham or, or, or whoever, whoever. I mean, you speak to Nebuchadnezzar, then later Belshazzar. Kind of, he, he kind of stood before him and said, Belshazzar, you are too prideful, and so on and so on. Okay, so a man used by God has his messenger. Daniel 5, verse 17 to 29. 6. <clears throat> a man of excellent spirit, noble character, and above reproach. Read Daniel 3. Because the subject of Darius was upset, because Daniel was the top three man, you know, Deputy Prime Minister number one, Deputy Prime Minister number two, Deputy Prime Minister number three. So they were jealous. They want to set him up. But they couldn't find, I tell you that is a highest comp, a compliment, not compromise, highest compliment. Say, they couldn't find anything to fault Daniel except pertaining to his wholeheartedness unto God. Yeah, wow. You know, many of us in the workplace, uh, uh, when people say, huh, you're a Christian? Uh? Oh, no, the one is a tell-all story. Okay, so, so it's a man of excellent spirit, noble character, and above reproach. Seven, men of prayer. One of the best places to learn about prayer is through the life of Daniel. That's the reason why chapter 6, he still prayed. Even though there's an edict that's being passed that you cannot pray. Most of us will be kind of like, anyway, I haven't been praying. It's true. <laughs> it's true. So, even if edict passed, no problem, I won't be praying. Just don't say grace during my lunch. It's because he has cultivated a life of prayer. To him, it's just normal. That's a key thing. Eight. Eight. A man who is uncompromising in obeying God. I love, you know, even his three friends. God will deliver us. And of course, then we all will say yes. But they say, even if God do not deliver us, we will not bow down to your image. Wow. You know, that is called uncompromising. Last one. A man who seeks revelation and understanding of the things of God. That's where he introduces the Daniel fast. Okay. By the way, Daniel fast cannot eat meat, pleasant food, nor than just cannot drink wine. Okay. Okay. So that's a nine character trait of the life of Daniel that recorded for us to emulate. Next one. <coughs> Next one. General outline of the book of Daniel. This is very important so that you, when you read, you don't get confused. Okay. The book of Daniel is the 12th chapter book. Okay. But the book is not entirely written in chronological order. In fact, the first six chapters and the second last six chapters are written in two different, is it called format? Structure. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 1 to Daniel chapter 6 is written in chronological order. I'll call it a historical section. So if you read Daniel 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, it's the whole flow. Okay? But Daniel chapter 7 to Daniel chapter 12 is actually more written in the prophetic structure, primarily centered around four dreams or visions of Daniel. With one chapter, he had an encounter where a mighty angel came. Okay, we should review a very important principle. Okay, so it's written in two structure. Chapter 1 to 6 is a historical section. Chapter 7 to 12 is written in a prophetic section. It's a prophetic section centered around four very important dreams or visions. Okay, which is in chapter 7, chapter 8. Chapter 9 and chapter 11 and 12. Chapter 11 and 12 is astounding. In about 50 over verses, there were 135 prophecies. And out of it, 100 of it has been fulfilled. With such accuracy and precision. That's why some scholars will say that the book of Daniel is the most you all like this word, young people. Most validated book. But some scholar, they do not believe that Daniel wrote the book because cannot be that true one or that accurate. Okay, so the book of Daniel is written in two sections. 
chapter 1 to 6, historical section. Chapter 7 to 12, prophetic section. Let me just run through briefly, okay? Also give you the timeline. Okay, anyway, I have a, another chart we're going to put up. Primarily give you the historical date related to the book of Daniel. Okay, so uh, let's go and put it out. Yeah. <laughs> Last week you edit, right? Wow, so many mistakes. Uh, right? yeah, okay, well, I got to edit right, but grammar may not be that correct. Okay, okay. chapter 1. Chapter 1, 606 BC. Chapter 1. Probably 606 BC. Uh, Daniel's early testing. I call it Daniel's early testing, but also show his dedication to God. Okay, that's where he was being exiled, selected to together with his three friends, you know, to be trained so that they can be served in uh, the courts of Nebuchadnezzar. But he refused to compromise. Okay, it's a very important chapter. Okay, so Daniel chapter 1, <coughs> 606 BC. Okay, Daniel's early testing and training that talks about his dedication to God. Okay, <coughs> he's probably about 15 years old, just deported from Jerusalem. Daniel chapter 2, probably 603. Some believe 602. Okay, so it's about 602, 603 BC. That's where this, uh, that's where. Nebuch uh, I call it Nebuchadnezzar's first dream. Okay, that's where he see a image, head that is gold, uh, body that is silver, then after that, thigh that is bronze, and then feet all the way to the toes are uh, of iron and also mixed with clay that give a very important uh, prophecy and future of subsequent major world empire all the way until the end of the age where you see the rise of Antichrist Empire and the Ten Nation Confederation, ending with Daniel, no, not Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar has a conclusion of the powerful dream where a stone came out, you know, uh, it's not huge, where it struck down all the empire where a mountain came out, which is a prophecy about God's millennial kingdom and God's kingdom established eternally. So that's Daniel chapter 2, 603 BC. Then Daniel chapter 3, 587 BC. 587 BC, where Daniel's three friends was tested by fire in refusing to bow down to worship the golden image of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, yeah. It's a very powerful prophetic picture an example of how end time generation will choose not to bow. This is like Revelation 12, 11. Okay, I pose you a question. Okay, go and find out. I will answer subsequently. Why weren't Daniel there? Only three friends. But Daniel weren't there. Not because he went to hide. Huh? Okay, so that's not even an answer. Okay, Daniel weren't there. Okay, go and figure out. I'll give you the answer later. Chapter 4. Chapter 4, 577 BC. Five, no, no, he's not the fourth man. Uh. That's, uh, that's the Messiah. <laughs> he's the fourth man. No, 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 he wasn't the fourth man. Okay, 577 BC, chapter 4. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. Nebuchadnezzar's second dream, where actually revealed to the pride of Nebuchadnezzar, and then because of his pride, God brought his downfall. But when he began to realize, you know, uh, God restored him, okay? And because of that, many believe that Daniel, no, not Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar actually got saved, okay? This is a chapter that is written by Nebuchadnezzar. That's chapter 4, 577 BC. <coughs> chapter 5. Chapter 5. 539 BC, okay, which is the, the sons of, one of the sons of uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Of course, this is the the, the third king that Daniel has served, Belshazzar, Belshazzar, okay, where he had a feast, okay. You know, that's where the term that we have, writing on the wall, okay. It actually means judgment, okay, where it talks about the downfall of Belshazzar because of pride and his cockiness that lead to the eventual downfall of the Babylonian Empire that caused the rise of the Medes Persian Empire. So that's Daniel 5. 
chapter 6, 537 BC. 537 BC. It's a very famous story. Daniel in the lion's den. Okay. No, he wasn't a young man then. By now, he's 85 years old or even older. Okay. Again, it's a very powerful prophetic picture of how end time saints will choose to refuse to compromise. It's a very important prophetic picture of Revelation 12 verse 11 people. Okay. We shall overcome even unto death. Okay. Then from chapter 7 to chapter 12 is a prophetic section, primarily with four either dreams or vision by Daniel. <coughs> chapter 7, 553 BC, Daniel probably received <coughs> this vision in 553 BC. His first vision is actually very similar to Daniel chapter 2. Though the symbol is slightly different, with additional information. Okay. In Daniel chapter 2, okay, God revealed the world empire with the rise of Antichrist empire, you know, through a gold, no, it's through a, a statue, okay, in different matter. Okay. This one is through four different, I won't call it, animal is not a right thing. The last one, not really an animal. The last one was a beast, okay. Lion, bear, uh, leopard, and then last one is a beast, you know. It's a horrible, fearsome, destructive beast, okay. But it's similar, but yet there's an additional information about Antichrist called the little horn, okay. It also show the millennial kingdom and the King of King, Lord of Lord, Daniel 7, where came the Son of Man. It's a very important prophetic word about their future King and Messiah for the Jewish people. So that's Daniel chapter 7, 553 BC. 553 BC. Then chapter 8, 551 BC. 551 BC is uh, Daniel's second visions or dream. Daniel's second vision or dream where it's about a goat, no, a ram, a ram with two horns. Okay, this is the, it, God is so precise. Why two horns? One longer, one shorter. Because it was a, a lion empire. Me, this, who is a, this powerful one, that's why the horn is shorter. And then uh, a Persian who is a longer horn. Then came the goat which is which empire? Greece empire, initially with one horn and run so swiftly without touching the ground. It's talking about Alexander the Great. Okay, then the horn was broken off and four subsequent horn came out. Okay, chapter four, I uh, know, chapter eight is very powerful, very important because chapter eight tells us with specific detail of this term. We will, we will talk about it much later abomination of desolation. And also through this Greek emperor called Antiochus Epiphany, give us a very powerful, detailed information of the personality and the nature of Antichrist. Daniel 20, no, Daniel chapter 8. So there's Daniel chapter 8, 501 BC. Daniel chapter 9, 538 BC. That's where Daniel prayed. And then Angel Gabriel came and gave him one of the most important, if not the most important, prophecy concerning end of the age. The 70 weeks prophecy. 70 weeks prophecy. It's a very important chapter because it teaches about prayer. Teaches about identification, repentance. But more so, it's a must-known prophecy for all end-time students and those who want to understand end-time. That's Daniel chapter 9, 536, no, 538 BC. Last one, Daniel 10 to 12. Daniel 10 to 12. Actually, 10 primarily is about his encounter with a mighty angel. Okay, which teaches us about the reality of spiritual warfare. 
and the power of prayer that actually shift kingdoms. And then Daniel 11 and 12, okay, uh, is a very detailed information of subsequent world empire leading to Israel's persecution and also specific revelation of the activity of Antichrist and his empire at the end of the age with that end time restoration of the nation of Israel. Okay, so that is a general outline of the book of Daniel. You want me to run through one more time? Okay, never mind. Let's go and watch the video. Too much, eh? <laughs> okay. Oh, which one you want me to run through again? 11, 12. Okay, wow. That Daniel 10, 11, 12. Okay. 11 and 12 primarily is about a uh, very specific prophecy about subsequent empire from Babylon all the way until the end time generation. There are 135 prophetic words. Uh, no, prophecy about nations, okay? Also give us very specific information of the activity of Antichrist at the end of the age. Plus, how Israel is going to be persecuted with, of course, the restoration of the nation of Israel at the end of the age and God established His kingdom. Got it? Okay, can, <clears throat> can I move on? Last one, last one, ah, second last one. Why study the book of Daniel? I give you five reasons. Why study the book of Daniel? I probably have say it here and there, but I'm going to say it one more time. First one, first one. Daniel is the prototype of end time messenger. Give us a very powerful divine picture of a forerunner or how does a forerunner or end time messenger of God looks like. Okay. Not in a very nice environment, not kind of teaching, you know, a forerunner school and so on. In a environment where wickedness and rebellion and darkness that is a highest. What do we say how do we operate? What do we say to God's people? What do we say to governmental leader and nations? And how do we operate? Primarily in wisdom of God, in counsel of God, in understanding of God, and in prophecy of God. Okay, because it's very important we know that is in the context of when evil and iniquity are at his fullness. What do we say? What do we tell God's people to take that stand? Also in the context of when God is refining his people. What do we say? We must have clarity. We must interpret it correctly because there can be God's discipline God's pruning or the devil's attack. Because all three we respond differently. If the devil attack, what do we do? We resist. If the discipline of God we want, we repent. If it's a pruning of God, what do we do? We yield and we submit and we thank God. Okay. Don't get it wrongly, you know. Devil attack, we thank God. You know, no, no. Okay. And also the uh, third thing is what are we saying when God is going to judge nations. That's where how uh, Daniel spoke to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4 and Belshazzar in Daniel 5. Very important, okay? And the last one, last one, uh, no, last one is actually, uh, I repeat, what do we say to kings and in authority during those periods? So that's the first reason why we study Daniel. Second, Second, we study Daniel because Daniel is a blueprint in how do we prepare our heart for end of the age. Okay, when everything falls apart, when all our religious system and support no longer exist in the midst of chaos, how do we stand firm? How do we find victory? 
how do we carry our heart? That's what the book of Daniel is about, primarily from Daniel 1 to 6. So there's a second reason. Third one. Third one. Third one. Third one is, it gives us confidence in God. Because the third one is show us that the sovereignty of God. That's the theme of Daniel. That's the theme of Daniel. Okay. Because if you read Daniel 7, God gave the saints to Antichrist and to be overcome by Antichrist for a season. Say, huh? Because he is in control. We need to know that he is in control. He's in charge, he still, he stir, and he directs the affairs of human history, including nations. So that we have confidence, we have hope because of the sovereignty of God. Just run through a couple of verses. Take me to Daniel 2, verse 20 to 22. Okay. Even Israel got exiled, it's because God is in control. When Nebuchadnezzar arrives, you read his dream, God is the one who established you, O King of Kings. It's because He is in control. So that we know, you know, in all things, we can have confidence God has never lost control. The fact that He allows it, we know that. He has a reason, okay? Daniel 2, verse 20. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are His. He changes times and seasons. He, that's why we need to know time and season. Is it transition, you know? It's not about, no, we need to plan. But planning has to be in the context of understanding God's time and season. That's a key thing. He removed kings and he raised up kings. Everything is within his control. We must be able to see it. You know, then people say, then why go and vote? We still need to exercise our responsibility to vote. But he's still in control. That's a key thing. Say, How about those countries that they have no choice, they are dictator? Then don't worry about it. He said, how come I'm born here? Because he put you here. Then everything is okay. That's a key thing. Because we know that he is in control. He's sovereign. Why am I born in such a time as this? Why not there? Why not here? And so on. Read Acts 17. That's what Daniel is about. Sovereignty of God. So that's the third reason. There are quite a number, okay. Quite a number. Fourth one. Fourth reason why we study the book of Daniel, because it teaches about prayers. Pray. Daniel is who he is. One of the key reasons is because he's a man of prayer. He didn't kanjong, uh, no. about to go to the lion's den really. Uh. He said, oh God, help me, help me. You know, I open window, you know, face Jerusalem. No. It's because of his lifestyle prayer that got him into trouble. You know, most of us will not be a problem. Say, I'm not praying one. You know, I'm trying to say, okay, importance of prayer. Primarily, three things. Insight into what does a man of prayer look like. Okay, so that we can cultivate, not to copy. Uh, no, this is not about being copied. Second, give us, especially Daniel 9, important, important principle of prayer. Daniel 9 is huge. The first half of the chapter, line upon line, give us a very important principle of prayer. Okay. Then the third one, insight into the reality of spiritual warfare and how prayer can shift kingdom. Daniel chapter 10. Daniel chapter 10. So that's the fourth one. Fourth one. <coughs> uh, Daniel chapter 10 is like Ephesians 6 of the Old Testament. Yeah. Okay, fifth one, last one. Okay, last one. Tell us about the seriousness of end time. Seriousness of end time. Also give us very important 
two important revelation. Nowhere else is that detail, not even the book of Revelation. Okay, Antichrist and abomination of desolation. Okay, Jesus taught end time in three chapters: Matthew twenty-four, Mark thirteen, Luke twenty-one. He only quoted one person. He didn't quote anyone. Not, not that Jesus is not into this quoting, you know. Yeah. He only quoted one person. And he only quoted one passage of scripture. Guess who he quoted? Daniel. Guess which two chapters he quoted? Daniel 11 and 12. You know, in Matthew 24, he said, there will not be, uh, uh, that, what's the verse called? There were, there were not, the nations will never face such a pressure, Daniel 12. And then he quoted abomination of desolation, Daniel 11 and Daniel 12. That's why this book is so important we study so that we understand and also we grasp the seriousness of end time. Last one. Let me go to close. Last one. <coughs> the book of Daniel gives us five very important pun frame pertaining to end time narrative and the timeline of God. Okay. We need to know. We need to know. Okay. First one. First one. Of course, we're going to break it down along the way. That's why I need at least 15 weeks, maybe even 20 weeks. So by the time, is it Jeremiah or Joel Chin? Or Jeremiah or Joel Chin? Still J1. <laughs> yeah. Or Jeconiah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Huh? Quite nice one. Jack and, Jack and I are chill. <laughs> no, joking. Okay. Okay. Jeremiah. Okay. Maybe by then Jeremiah come out already. Yeah. No, yeah. Come out and say, Yes, uh, 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 I have a plan that is for you. you know, plan is to bless you and it's not to harm you. you. Say, Hey, do you know what context is that? Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Never mind. That, the first time frame Daniel 9, verse 27. The final seven years of human history before the second coming of Jesus. Okay, we know it as seven years. Okay, commonly called end times. Okay, so that's the first time frame. Daniel 9, verse 27. Second, just write down first. Daniel 7, verse 25. Daniel 9, verse 27. Daniel 12, verse, verse 7. Okay, time, times, half a time which is the time frame for the Great Tribulation, final three and a half years before Jesus return. So that's the second time frame. Third one, third, fourth, and fifth, most people miss it, but it's very critical. Daniel 12, verse 11. Daniel 12, verse 11. 1,290 days. One hundred, two hundred, no, one, uh, no, sorry, okay, I go all over, okay, fasting, fasting, okay, okay, <laughs> 1,290 days, what did I say, 1,000, oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry, 1,290 days, okay, <laughs> don't topple, uh, I never laugh until like that, can you be more lady-like, no, I'm just kidding, 1,290 days, okay, okay, which is, Extra 30 days after the second, no, extra 30 days after the Great Tribulation. It's very important 30 days where uh, we will we'll put it together much later where it talks about the second coming procession of Jesus as well as the final wrath of God being poured out called the bold judgment in Revelation chapter 16. Okay, Fourth time frame. <coughs> Daniel 12, verse 12. Daniel 12, verse 12. 1,335 days. I got it right this time. Huh? Okay. 1,335 days, which is another 45 days after the 1,290 days, which is a transition to the Millennium Kingdom, where God is going to cleanse the earth. Okay. Last one. <coughs> Last one. Daniel. Huh? 
Ah, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Sorry. Uh, what did I say? Okay, sorry. I thought 1,100 and 100 days. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Cleanse Jerusalem. Then cleanse Jerusalem, then transition to the Millennium Kingdom. Last one, Daniel 8, verse 14. Daniel 8, verse 14. 2,300 days. 2,300 days. Which give us the durations of the abomination of desolation. The duration of the abomination of desolation. Okay, we're going to put all this thing together in the subsequent week until Jeremiah comes. Okay, okay, let's pray. Yeah, let's pray. Ah, Jerusalem Temple. Yeah, let's pray. Uh, what did I say? Yeah, I mean, together with abomination, the uh, establishment of 2,300 days all the way. Yeah, I will put it together. Okay. Uh, what did I say? I say duration of abomination. No, the duration of abomination is uh, uh, 1,290 days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We ask that more than just today, more than just on during the teaching, even as we open up the book of Daniel, open our heart, open our eyes. Will you reveal your heart even unto us so that truly we will understand and more than that, we will be strengthened and encouraged and we will be made ready even to partner with you. We come in this time, we love you. Lead us even in this journey. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.